Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Technology, a podcast exploring the latest in computers, networking, home automation, mobile computing, and all things technology related. Our hosts will take a deeper dive into the latest and greatest in tech trends and give you the information you need to enable your tech-centric world. This is Insights into Technology, Episode 5, Actions Have Consequences. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and this is the tech news for this week. First up, we have an article from The Record. Proposed rules ban U.S. companies from selling sensitive data. The Biden administration has formally proposed new legislation, or sorry, new regulations, that would restrict the sale and transfer of sensitive personal data, such as health, financial, and geolocation data, to six adversarial nations, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, and Venezuela. Executive Order 14117 is aimed at addressing severe national security risks posed by potential data breaches and cyber espionage. These rules aim to address national security risks by foreign actors exploiting bulk data to carry out cyber attacks and espionage. The new regulations set strict thresholds for data transactions and impose compliance requirements based on cybersecurity frameworks with exemptions for certain telecommunications and clinical trial data. Though with congressional and presidential elections just weeks away, there's doubt as to whether there will be any forward movement on the bill this year. So this is another instance of what I popularly rail against, unfunded mandates by the government. Now, that's not to say that this isn't a necessary step in ensuring cybersecurity. However, there are implications in proposing this type of regulation that will have an impact on multiple industries that that wind up being affected by this. The first thing that we have to worry about is the increased operational costs. In order to maintain these types of bans, and to put the housekeeping tools in place that are needed in order to ensure that these regulations are actually adhered to, there's going to be a cost associated with that for infrastructure. Um, This is also going to have effect on global data flow. Right now, the internet doesn't have borders, despite the fact that Russia and China would like you to think that it does. So anytime that you're doing geo blocking or, or, you know, everyone does geo blocking for, for safety reasons, but anytime that you're proposing regulations like this in where you are basically restricting not even just certain countries, but certain types of data to certain countries, it has a negative impact. There are interconnectivity considerations that need to be worked out to make sure that we're not breaking systems in the process of this. Obviously, cybersecurity is at the forefront of the motivation for this, but there's a very good chance that when you impose these types of restrictions on organizations who are either not capable of adhering to them or don't have the resources to ensure that they're handled properly, you could cause an even worse situation from a cybersecurity standpoint. Now, there are significant risks to cyber espionage that we've seen already between just recently uh, information leaking on Israel's planned um, retaliation against Iran for their attacks. But you get this a lot with 
um, industrial espionage with Defense Department documents and drawings and information like that. So it's a definite concern, but it's another one of these kind of heavy handed ways of the federal government trying to protect things in a knee jerk reaction. Uh, the other problem that you run into is it's a couple of weeks before an election and this is a Biden administration initiative. It's there's a good chance that a, a Harris administration would follow through with this, but it's not a guarantee. And chances are anything that Biden is doing here, if Trump <laughs> comes back to office, he's not going to do any of this, which, you know, at that point in time, we're kind of back to square one. So there's a lot that needs to wash out from this. Uh, the one, I guess, positive takeaway from this is the fact that the federal government is recognizing this information is leaking. The, the kind of inside joke here is that it's not just these countries, these adversarial countries that this information is leaking to. This information is leaking to data brokers like NPD. It's leaking to social media companies like Meta and X. So th there's a lot of other layers in which the security of this information is being compromised. And the federal government only seems interested in looking at a very small subsector of where this information is being uh, offloaded to. So a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, the next article that we have here comes to us from TechCrunch. And they tell us that the SEC is cracking down on misleading cybersecurity disclosures following the solar winds attack the securities and exchange commission has charged four companies for making misleading disclosures about the 2019 solar winds data breach the affected companies checkpoint mindcast unisys and avaya are facing penalties ranging from 990,000 to $4 million for downplaying the impact of the breaches. The SEC stated that these companies provided investors with insufficient information regarding the true scope of the cyber attacks. While all companies cooperated with the investigation, they neither admitted nor denied the SEC's findings. The violations varied among the companies, with Avaya failing to disclose the extent of data access, Checkpoint using vague descriptions of the breach, Mimecast minimizing the attack's severity, and Unisys treating the breach as a hypothetical event. Sanjay Wada, acting director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, emphasized the importance of transparency from companies affected by cyber attacks to protect shareholders and the public from further harm. So this is a, this is a significant issue. There are numerous cybersecurity frameworks that are in use uh, in different parts of the world. The U.S. tends to adhere to NIST standards. Uh, most of your European countries tend to uh, adhere to ISO standards. But each of these frameworks has a incident response plan built into them. And, and that incident response plan basically dictates who you communicate, how you communicate, when you communicate, and how much you communicate. And they're pretty much all consistent across the board with some minor variations. And the frameworks only work when you adhere to these disclosure rules and, and, and the other rules that are obviously built into these frameworks. So when you have a situation where you have companies that are being breached in what turns out to be very public breaches, and they're clearly aware of what the notification process is, because if they weren't aware of it, they wouldn't have skirted it the way that they did with, I wouldn't even say a delicate touch. I mean, they very deliberately avoided a public disclosure of factual information. 
which is almost conspiratorial in the way that it was handled. But what this does is it heightens the concern about the honesty that you're getting from these companies now. Anytime a company does have a breach, a lot of times if it's involving personally identifiable information, you typically don't hear about it until months or years later after the fact that after all that information is out the door already in, in the hands of nefarious evildoers, we'll say. And the consequence of that type of information is usually, you know, monitoring of your credit report or, or whatever, which a year after the fact doesn't really help you all that much. So the ability to actually have this information in a timely manner and in an accurate manner so that the end users or the clients or customers or whoever's involved in the breach has the ability to do what they need to do to protect themselves is critical. And that's it's one of the fundamental aspects of these cybersecurity frameworks. The other problem that you run into is you're undermining your, your investor confidence and you're shirking your corporate responsibility. Now, in cases like this, there's legal ramifications. In other cases, it's reputational loss or it could be a loss of revenue. Uh, or it could be taking a significant loss on the share price, which doesn't just impact the management of the company, it impacts all the investors. So there's a lot of secondary casualties that happen when uh, we don't deal with these disclosures in a timely and factual manner. The other problem you run into is the people that are downstream from you have their own cybersecurity adherence that they have to comply with. And for my company, for instance, if one of my upstream vendors or suppliers has a breach, I need to be notified about it so I can notify, so I can obviously take the necessary steps to protect my organization, but also to protect the people that are downstream from me as well. And when this chain of communication is broken or distorted, as it was in this case here, you've now put all of those other entities at a higher risk of exposure and damage. Um, so clearly there's legal responsibility that has to be looked at in this case here. And it also emphasizes the shift now towards cybersecurity governance and accountability. There's more outside pressure. There are numerous governing bodies that would police this type of thing, not the least of which is the federal government. And ultimately, what you're doing is you're jeopardizing your relationships with your vendors and your partners with this when you are not honest with it. And that's not even to say your own customers, because clearly you're, you're, you're violating the trust of your customers. But you have typically some type of arrangement in place already for reporting this type of thing to your vendors and your partners. And when you deliberately violate that trust, you're significantly jeopardizing their safety and that relationship. So while it's not surprising to see the federal government stepping in to handle this type of thing, What's really disturbing and, and disappointing on numerous levels is that you have companies that are deliberately trying to manipulate the information that's released in a way that doesn't make them look bad, which ultimately that truth is going to come out and make them look even worse. So they gain nothing from, from the misdirection. Uh, next up is an article from CNN. Uh, this one is again, you know, social media back in the high in the in the headlines again. Uh, X users' data is now fueling AI and what you need to know. X is duly unveiled terms of service set to take effect on November fifteenth. Has sparked controversy by allowing the platform to use user-generated content to train its artificial intelligence models. This includes a wide range of content posted on X, 
from tweets to personal photos, raising concerns among artists and creators who fear their work could be used to power AI that may replace human creativity. Additionally, users are worried about the use of their personal information in AI training, and justifiably so. X's update also specifies that any legal disputes will be handled in courts located in Tarrant County, Texas, a venue favored by conservative activists, further fueling concerns about user rights. With similar data sharing practices exist across many social platforms, X's terms uniquely remove ambiguity by clearly stating that the user content can be used for AI development. Prior to this change, users could opt out of sharing their data for AI purposes, but it's unclear whether that option will remain available under the new terms. So, on one hand, you can give X credit for being transparent about their intentions, which gives all the users the option at that point in time to opt out of using that service, which officially I have personally. And the podcast has distanced itself from X at this point in time and probably will be removing itself from X in conjunction with this uh, and recent changes to blocking rules that they've implemented. So the problem that you're running into here. And there's a lot of different problems, obviously. But we talk about data governance challenges for businesses. Um, A lot of businesses use X for marketing and self-promotion and and so forth. Uh, A lot of companies also use it to communicate in a timely and open way to their customers to get messaging out. I know uh, not that long ago we had had some storms low through here uh, we lost power and uh, the local power company was communicating at the time it was twitter before it became x but they were communicating real-time updates through that which was very helpful to the users the problem that you run into with the possibility almost a guarantee that your information is going to be used for ai processing is if you put proprietary information out there that proprietary information is now being gobbled up for AI and large language models and becomes a a data governance issue and a security issue, which ultimately can lead to legal risks if you have information out there that's being ingested into an AI that can then either be manipulated or regurgitated in manners that your company is not prepared for. Let's not even talk about the ethical implications of misusing users' data here without their permission. If they remove the opt-out ability, uh, they're basically hijacking your information, your personal data, and, and your communications and posts and preferences and usage data, uh, which makes it very difficult to maintain corporate compliance when you've got companies' data that's out there now that's going to be used for this as well. This is a a good example of why people tend to be so concerned about AI and AI governance uh, because data is money. And I think everyone understands at this point in time, if you're not paying for a service, you are the business model of that service. So your data, your habits, where you visit it, scrubbing the cookies out of your browser, all these things are all information that can now be ingested into this AI. And your information is now being used in ways that you don't want it to be used. So uh, they're going to run down a very slippery slope here if they remove the opt-out ability or at least make it more ambiguous than it is at this point in time. And I think you're seriously going to jeopardize the role of, of... your users who are businesses as well. I don't think businesses can afford to operate in an environment where their data is not being respected and their data wishes are not being respected. So I think this is going to have a negative impact on X, but, you know, it's 
it's kind of been run into the ground since Musk has taken over anyway. So this really doesn't surprise me that this is the the next move in that downward spiral to the gutter. So that was uh, that was our first couple stories we have there. Before we move on, though, I do want to take a moment to uh, invite the listening and viewing audience. If you don't already do so, subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio and video versions of this in all of our podcasts listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and so forth. I would also invite you to uh, reach out, give us some feedback. You can call in, leave a voicemail for us. The number is 856-403-8788. That's 856-403-8788. Leave us a message. Um, If you want us to get that comment up on the air, we can certainly do so. Just mention it in the message when you leave it. You can also email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Or you can find links to all that and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And we'll be right back with more technology news. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. (laughs) Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Technology. Our next article comes to us from the Associated Press. Russia is behind the Tim Walls disinformation campaign. U.S. intelligence officials have confirmed that groups in Russia were behind a viral disinformation campaign targeting Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Walls. The campaign spread false accusations about Walls' time as a teacher using manipulated content uh, linked to Russian disinformation operations. This marks the latest effort by Russia to undermine Democratic campaigns and sow discord ahead of the U.S. elections. Federal authorities stopped short of concluding that artificial intelligence was used to create the video, though it showed clear signs of manipulation. Alongside Russia, both China and Iran have also been involved in disinformation efforts, though there's no indication of significant threats to election infrastructure. However, officials assure the, that improved security measures make foreign interference unlikely to alter the election results. Now, it, it's tough to avoid political stories this time of year. We're, what, two weeks from an election at this point in time. And this type of news, unfortunately, is not surprising given Uh, what we've seen in the last couple of presidential elections. It it does signify the growing threat of digital manipulation. I mean, we've seen everything from deep fakes on conference calls to an increase in uh, phishing sophistication with AI injection into that process. Um, And it also shows the next danger of AI and disinformation. And I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody that AI is is a significant tool in disinformation. 
Anytime you can take existing information, manipulate it in such a way as to make it look convincing and then put it out there for the public, uh, it, it's a disinformation tool at that point in general. With AI, AI is supercharging that ability with its vast sample size of text to work with, its ability to create natural language responses. Uh, it just makes it much easier, you know, instead of having a hammer to put a nail on the wall, you know, I've got a sledgehammer, you can knock it in in one shot. Uh, this does also highlight the enterprise vulnerability to z disinformation campaigns. This is political in nature, obviously, but this could easily be done in a corporate mentality or corporate world to manipulate stock prices, uh, adjust customer satisfaction levels, or even to put out misinformation about executives that can cause controversial issues that further affect the stock price and performance. Um, trust is becoming a much more rare commodity now, I think, in information systems. Uh, and AI is playing a part in that, unfortunately. Uh, there needs to be updates in our defense mechanisms. Uh, that's that's really one of the biggest things that we have to worry about right now is we need real-time defenses. Um, our real-time defenses that we had before were virus scanning and, and email scanning and, and so forth. But you almost need to have an AI defense mechanism in place that's scrubbing everything that comes in. And you can only do that with AI, which is kind of the irony behind the whole thing is that AI needs to be fighting AI at this point in time. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to establish trust in any of your information systems moving forward. But this does speak to the broader cybersecurity landscape and the challenges that we face now. It's not just about social engineering. It's not just about stopping phishing campaigns or malicious software. It's it's literally stopping misinformation that is then used to fuel all of those other mechanisms. It's so much easier now with AI to conduct social engineering attacks and convince people that emails and requests and money transfers are more legit now than, than ever before. And I really think the only way we're going to combat that is with a defensive AI working for us rather than these aggressive AIs working against us. So um, it's, it's going to, time will tell how well we come out after this. I think uh, I have confidence in our election system still. I think most Americans are smart enough to see through a lot of the propaganda and a lot of the nefarious people that are trying to interfere with the elections at this point in time. At least I hope they do. We'll see you in a few weeks. Um, our next article up is from Engadget. Uh, this one talks about AI meeting journalism. OpenAI and Microsoft invest in newsroom innovation. Just when you thought AI couldn't get more scary. OpenAI and Microsoft have announced $10 million in grants to support AI-powered journalism initiatives. The funding will be distributed to news organizations such as Chicago Public Media, the Minnesota Star Tribune, Newsday, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Seattle Times. Each outlet will receive an AI fellow for two years to explore ways to implement AI technologies and improve business sustainability. This initiative comes as both companies face legal battles from media outlets accusing them of using content for AI modeling training without permission. Despite these tensions, some publications like Condé Nast have reached licensing agreements with OpenAI. OpenAI and Microsoft are each contributing $2.5 million in direct funding and $2.5 million in software credits. 
The project is being executed in collaboration with the Lenfest Institute of Journalism, with a second round of grants expected for additional publications. So, right, more AI, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, at least they're trying to use this in a way that's creative at this point. And again, this is not a, we're not looking at an adversarial type of use here. But one of the concerns that we have right now with AI is, well, obviously plagiarism, but also digital rights management. So you have a lot of AI models out there right now that are sampling everything, everything that's in a public domain, some things that may be even behind paywalls, and they're drawing on all that to generate what their AI generates. And you've got a lot of creative entities and artists out there who are basically having their work plagiarized and stolen from them. Uh, And you have, you've already had numerous stories of news organizations that are artificially creating content using AI. And and we've had lawyers that have written um, case long and and defenses based on AI generated uh, legal case information that was pure fiction. Um, And it went unchecked until it faced the scrutiny of a courtroom. So uh, there's a there's a significant push uh, for how to properly use AI and how to fuel AI with with content. AI is starved for content constantly, so you're seeing content come in from multiple angles. Um, AI is a tool for innovation. I use it quite frequently. I'll I'll have it reword emails for me to lighten the emails a little bit and make them a little more simplified if I'm communicating with non technical people. Um, I've used it extensively for, for research. I've used it for writing, uh, policies for some of my cybersecurity policies that had to be written. Uh, it's, it's not something that you can just push a button and let it spit out what you need. It takes some effort. It takes like with any tool, it needs to be used properly and, and, and it needs to be used for the right job. Um, they're, you know, kudos to Microsoft and OpenAI for for going down this route and trying to get ahead of the curve, even though to a certain extent the genie's out of that bottle. But I think their focus on balancing innovation and intellectual property rights here, to a large extent, it's kind of covering themselves because they're the ones that are being accused of it right now. And I think to a significant extent, this is really just a redirection to try to get, you know, attention away from the negative things. I don't know how serious they are about this. I mean, 2.5 or $5 million drop in a bucket for OpenAI and for Microsoft. So they're clearly not putting themselves in the poorhouse with this effort. I really think this is just another example of the industry trying to self-regulate itself before the government steps in to clear things up. Um, But, you know, we'll, we'll see. There's, there's a lot that needs to kind of come out of this. This is a multi-year plan that they have here. And, and I don't doubt that good things will come out of this, but I don't really OpenAI and Microsoft aren't striking me as being particularly altruistic with this. This is really kind of them trying to police themselves to save any agony they'd run into from the government. I could be wrong, but we'll we'll see in time. Uh, Our next story comes to us from The Record, UK report on cyber essentials certification. The UK government is celebrating the success of its Cyber Essentials Certification Scheme, launched a decade ago, despite record levels of cyber attacks in the country. Cybersecurity Minister Furyal Clark highlighted that organizations with Cyber Essentials Certifications 
are 92% less likely to file insurance claims compared to those without it, signaling the scheme's effectiveness. However, uptake remains slow, with fewer than 1% of eligible organizations having obtained certification as of February. Experts like Joseph Jarnecki from the Royal United Services Institute argue that while the scheme shows promise, its low adoption raises questions about its overall impact and value. To boost adoption, the UK government is pushing for large businesses to require their suppliers to adopt cyber essentials, a strategy supported by the country's biggest banks. This initiative may also be reinforced by the upcoming Cybersecurity and Resilience Bill, which aims to update UK cybersecurity laws and protect supply chains. While targeting larger economic players would drive greater adoption, experts warn that more aggressive regulation may be needed to ensure widespread implementation across the economy. Now, this one kind of hits pretty close to home for me because we call it something different, but one of the things that we do here, we're doing here in the U.S. is uh, our cybersecurity maturity model, which is based on the NIST 800-171 standards, uh, but it's customized a little bit more than that with its controls. They started out down this voluntary path, I'm going to say back in 2016, 2018, uh, with the DFARS rulings that we had to adhere to. And they were all self-attested, self-audited initiatives that were compliance was required in order to land certain government jobs that required handling of uh, covered unclassified information. The problem you run into there is it was expensive. You know, we, we paid significant amount of money to get to where we were with it. Uh, and we were pretty far along before CMMC came in. So it wasn't inexpensive to get there. And as a result, a lot of the smaller, I don't want to say mom and pop shops, but, you know, a lot of the smaller shops out there that are doing subcontracting work for the government couldn't afford to, to hire a, a reputable security firm like we did and implement a secure enclave like we did. Uh, so a lot of these companies, because it was self-reporting and self-auditing, simply checked the box to get the the contracts that they wanted to get and continue to do business and kind of largely ignored it until CMMC came along and the self-reporting and self-attestation aspect of it became a requirement. And and the requirement for third-party auditing was brought into play here. And it started to be incorporated into federal contracts in the United States. And if you weren't compliant, or had a path to compliance, or showed an honest effort to be compliant or try to get compliant, you simply weren't getting these contracts anymore. Uh, the system isn't perfect the way it is now, but I absolutely see them going in that direction in the UK. Um, you are not going to motivate people to take this stuff seriously when it's as expensive as it is when all they have to do is check a box, or in this case, not even check a box because it's not a requirement. And I think once you put that requirement in there, uh, you're going to start getting some level of compliance. And the, the, I guess the model that they're operating under here is primarily a trickle down type of mentality where you need your primes to take it seriously. And they need to flow those requirements down to subcontractors, but you're starting at the top and, and you can start at the top because the people at the top are the ones that have the kind of IT budgets that are needed to do these things. You're inevitably going to reach a point as you trickle down and sometimes not very far from the top where you just don't have the budgets anymore. Early versions and early talk about CMMC 2.0 talked about having some type of 
program where you can file for cost reimbursements or, you know, some way to lighten that financial burden. None of that has really come into play at this point in time yet. We haven't realized any of that or seen any of it yet. I don't hold out much hope of that. Uh, the federal government is generally not in the in the market f- of giving out funding for these mandates that they drop. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the market regulations in the UK as to whether or not they would put out any kind of incentive like that. Um, typically, it's a carrot and stick approach. Um, the federal government here, it's mostly a stick approach where if you don't do it, you're going to get punished for it. And I think if the UK takes that tack, they're going to have an uptick in adoption, but you're also going to cause a significant issue for a lot of your um, existing contractors. And, and you need to be ready to, to shake up your contractors at this point in time and possibly put a lot of companies out of business that depend on those, those kind of cover, government contracts if they can't adhere to your standards anymore. So there's definitely implications that need to be taken into consideration outside of the immediate cybersecurity concerns. Um, That's it for the news section of this. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more technology. We'll be right back. Are you tired of your favorite gaming podcast finishing with a play? Oh, no! Well, check out No Credits Rolled, where we play the games but rarely finish them. How's it going, folks? I'm Sam Whalen, your friendly host at No Credits Rolled, the ultimate gaming podcast, where we dish out the latest scoops and reviews on all your beloved video games. Hey, listen! Not only that, but we spice things up with some guest interviews and even give you, yes, you, a chance to have your say. Tune in every other week for a fresh dose of No Credits Rolled, available on all major podcast platforms, and hit us up on social media at No Credits Rolled. So why wait? Let's dive into the gaming world together, where finishing games is optional, but the fun is guaranteed. Welcome back to Insights into Technology. Uh, we've finished up with our tech news of the week. Uh, I did want to continue. I had a chance to sit down last week with a good friend of mine, Howard Dorch. Howard is a uh, industry expert. He's worked for Sony Online Entertainment as a developer. He worked for AMD. I know he was he was uh, instrumental in in the Athlon engineering the Athlon project. He is a respected indie developer. He ended his career in academia, actually, teaching uh, video game development at uh, at Shawnee University. And I had a chance to sit down with him. I've known Howard for about 10 years now or so. He's actually uh, a friend from an online gaming community, my Star Wars The Old Republic gaming community. And he and I have known each other for about 10 years now. And uh, he's always an educational and entertaining discussion. So we we did part one of uh, our interview last week. We're going to do part two of the interview this week, and we'll see uh, we'll see how far we get. We may do a part three. Um, but uh, I give you Howard Dorch and his uh, journey through the technology landscape. So I got to sit in the uh, research and development labs with when the Athlon first came to be. And uh, I did a whole lot of testing on the, on the uh, processor, you know, like core validation, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, fun times. Interesting. You know, it was a, like a, a brand new processor. You know, the, the Athlon was the first computer. I mean, it was a next generation computer and it was the first computer that could decode three simultaneous instructions. In other words, for every clock cycle, it could, it could clock through three instructions. Right. 
So you would have a integer instruction, you would have a floating point instruction, and then you would have an SSE instruction. And if you coded it right, um, three instructions at a time, that was like amazing. And, uh, you know, it was, it, they had to fine tune the microcode um, to, uh, to uh, decode the, the software that was coming in, you know, like what, what are they doing? They're accessing floating points. So they had certain taglines they had to put on it. And then it went down through the pipes. You know, I mean, I got into the, into the actual step-by-step movement of code through a processor. Which again, brain sweat. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was like it was a it had never been done before. That that kind of a processor had never been done before. And um the cool thing about it was basically they could run uh the AMD, the Athlon at a lower speed and do twice the throughput that a at an Intel computer could do. Right. So, yay. <laughs> so what we've done. So how long were you at, at uh, AMD at that point? Uh, I spent two, two years, maybe three years there. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it, my job, my job there got to be, um, there was, there was a product that we developed called Code Analyst. And what it did was people would write code for the Athlon processor and we could take without running the code, we could take the code and disassemble it and run it through a pseudo computer. And we could look at it and uh, actually calculate how many machine cycles each instruction was going to take. I mean, we, we could read the code without actually executing it in the code. Wow. That's so, yeah, think about it. Brain sweat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was I was the person that they assigned to break it. You know, it's like um, I'm a game programmer, so this thing was designed to be sent to all the game uh, houses so that they could optimize their code. You know, it's like uh, here's our code for this game, and we could run it through the code analyst. And it would spit out a whole uh, list of, you know, this could be faster, this could be faster. You have sort of load forwarding problems here. You had, you know, just down to the machine cycle. I mean, we we got it down to a machine cycle. We could tell you how fast your code was going to run. And uh, they would use that to, um, uh, you know, speed up their code. So um, the people that were writing it got me to put it through its paces. So I wrote video games here. Um, I, I had since moved my office to Ohio <laughs> from Austin. Um, I went in one day and asked my boss if I could work at home because what I did was so specific. And he said, sure. And I said, well, I'm moving my home 1,200 miles away, if that's all right. <laughs> so they set me up with it. <laughs> They set me up with a VPN here and uh, I could stay hooked up to the, to the shop in Austin. But um, what I did was I took the code analyst, I would write code and I would uh, take the code analyst and actually break it. I could, I could tell it, you know, here, here is what I want to do. I want to, I want to change things from, like I said, I'm going to do a four by four matrix multiply. I can multiply two four by four matrices in 50 machine cycles. And the product, the code analyst that we were building choked on it. It's like, Oh my God, you can't do that. (laughs) And it would crash. So I would get the uh, crash logs and I'd send them back to the, to the uh, group and they would rewrite the code so that uh, the code analyst could process it. So that's what I did right at the end before I uh, retired to college. Okay. So, so, okay. That's a, that's a great segue right there. So you go from uh, working at AMD to academia, but you you had another extension in there with your own business doing video game development too, didn't you? Yeah. Well, um, like I said, part of, 
part of my testing for AMD was I was working on my own games. You know, I mean, why not? I, it, the product was developed to work with game developers. So I just made myself a game developer and uh, I wrote video games and use code analyst to, uh, to optimize it. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I wound up, um, uh, I think Hypercat's still alive. Um, you know, I, I did, um, uh, uh, a, uh, Mars simulator cause I was deep into Mars. So there's two or three Mars simulators there. There's a, a version of uh scud buster that I'd updated and, um, there's a, a shooter game that I did and all of them are pretty much old technology now, but, um, you know, they were exercises. Uh, and I did part of them when I, when I started teaching at college, um, I did part of the games as a, as a test for the kids, kids, young people, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hate to offend. Um, so part of, part of their, development and what we were doing uh was to work on these games like what if we did this what if we did that what if we uh you know what should the ui look like and that sort of thing so i went ahead and coded it and uh put the games some of them are up on steam hyper hyper x ball was <laughs> one of my that was a fun one, one. We, we did play that one a few times yeah we we did we did play that one a few times and that one came about from actual ball in my backyard and a shotgun. <laughs> you know, I was, well, I was cleaning my shotgun one day and, and I was like, okay, I'll go out and fire a couple of rounds just to, just to uh, keep it loosened up. And there was a kid's ball out there, you know, and so I shot it and the thing flew up in the air and I thought, holy crap, that's a video game. So I came back in the house and, <laughs> wrote a video game amazing where the inspiration comes from yeah yeah sometimes it gets kind of weird but uh yeah that's uh that's how hyperball started and as it turns out really weird i put it up for sale and all of my sales not all of them but i'd say 90 percent of my sales were eastern european interesting the russians the ukrainians uh you know that area over there oh they loved it. They had, they put together leagues and they were having, you know, league wars and, uh, you know, they were sending me emails about, you know, these things. I, of course I couldn't translate it. I had to get a friend to translate Oh, but yeah, they had, um, they had like six teams in a, in a group versus a, a, another six teams and they played against each other. Like you would, you know, baseball games. Right. That's crazy. And, uh, they, they come up with a champion and everything. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a nuts thing. And I, of course, I tried to get people, you know, here to uh, play the game with me. And I don't know. Somehow they just didn't understand the the uh, fun that it could be playing soccer with shotguns. And you would think America, with our love affair with guns over here, would have taken yeah. off. Would have taken off Absolutely. like crazy over here. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be. Uh, <laughs> Let's do that. That sounds like fun. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was uh, Ukraine, Russia, Poland, you know, those, those people. That's great. Yeah. It lasted so, for quite a while too. So you moved into academia. You were teaching yeah. uh, video game development, video game design. What exactly did you do for, for the college? Well, um, college found out that I was in town because I had moved, you know, back to Ohio. They had found out that I was in town and, um, you know, colleges back then, universities, colleges, um, looked at video games like, uh, it's a fad, it's a toy. It's not going to go anywhere. It'll and, never be a multi-billion dollar industry, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you gotta have uh, math and English and science and, you know, you gotta, you gotta be a, I don't know, whatever. So uh, little by little, the colleges and the universities started seeing, you know, well, maybe this stuff isn't going to go away. Maybe we better jump on the bandwagon. What they did was 
you know, you have a, you have an industry and then you had a bunch of people. So what the university decided was, I know, let's get in the middle and have the people have to go through us in order to get to the industry. <laughs> yeah. So once the colleges and universities figured out that they could do that, well, here we go. Katie, bar the door. <laughs> let's hire somebody to teach video game design. Well, unfortunately, no colleges or universities offered a degree in video game design. So, uh, all right, here we go. Who are we going to get? Well, they had to hire somebody from the industry. So a lot of the colleges all hired people, programmers from the industry to set up the, the uh, video game program for various colleges and universities. And they found out that I was there and I did EverQuest and, you know, multitude of other things. They said, would you please come down to college and help us set up a, um, a, uh, you know, program for uh, video games and uh, teach. I said, sure. What you paying? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, you get a bunch of kids in a room and you're talking video games and uh, the brain sweats because <laughs> that was, that was a chore, but it all worked out great. You know, we had, um, I think at one time the university was uh, listed number three in the nation by uh, Princeton review. It might've been fifth or third, fifth, something like that. But, you know, it turned out they uh, invested a lot of money. They got a mocap uh, studio and, um, you know, they started teaching game programming and uh, started, the artists started doing game artwork and, you know, game design. And uh, every year they have a, um, a little get together where, you know, they invite people from the industry to, to come there and they have this big festival and all the kids show up, the young people <laughs> show off their uh, video game designs and what they've done. So it's all worked out great. Howard, it's okay. I think you've reached that point in your life where anybody who's less than 30 years your age, you can call them kids at this point. And it's not offensive. <laughs> well, yeah, well, <laughs> you've earned get off it. my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> so how yeah. long? Uh, yeah. How long were you were you uh, teaching at the university? Uh, Nine point seven five years. Well, that's awfully precise. Yes, it is because my retirement was based on it. They were they were supposed to give me another quarter year, <laughs> which I'm still negotiating with. Good for you. Yeah. So were yeah, you about, about 10 years? Did the kids like you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was. Uh, they made me favorite teacher once upon a time. So, OK, just to kind of support that. So you're not boasting yourself. I did go out and do a little bit of research and there's a, a website called Rate My Professor. Uh, and you had five ratings up there, four of which gave you five stars. And wow. they had very kind things to say about you. One one of your students said, knows this stuff, easy to understand, just do your assignments and show up. That's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward, yep. Um, somebody else said, one of the best Shawnee State experienced, funny, motivational, and dangerously knowledgeable about the gaming field. I think that sums it up. But the last one is the one that, that I think is my most favorite because I think this was kind of um, the same experience that I think I, I had with you. You might dislike him at first, <laughs> but you'll learn to love him. And that's exactly the experience you and I think I think had. Um, they go on to say he can be a little much sometimes, which you can, but he's a cool guy, keeps you busy with work that feels helpful. Uh, as well as being fun, definitely an enjoyable class that has a lot to offer and produces a ton of laughs and good times. So you obviously left a very good impression with your students, which I think is a testament to your personality. Yeah, they uh, they still contact me. I mean, uh, they try to friend me on uh, Discord and, you know, Facebook and all that. So uh, I stay in touch with them. 
you know, how you doing, what you doing. That's awesome. A couple of them actually made it into the industry, which I'm happy to say. So um, nice. Yeah, yeah, it was great. You know, when you when you spend all that time with them, and you know, some of them are there uh, just just to clock the four years, right? And then some of them are there hungry. You know, I want yeah. to do this. I have to do this. It's in my blood. I have to do this. You have to show me how to do this. They kept me busy. Yeah. They, they made me work. And those are the ones that went out. And first thing they did is I'm going to go find a job. Mm -hmm. And they went out and got a job in the industry. That's awesome. Okay. Cool beans. Yeah. All right. That is it for this week here. We'll continue uh, next week with more technology news. Before we do go, I want to once again invite <clears throat> my listening and viewing audience. If you don't already do so, please subscribe to the podcast. You can find us listed as Insights into Things. Uh, we are available on Apple, Spotify, Google, anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to give us your feedback. You can give us a call at 856-403-8788. Uh, leave us a voicemail. Tell us what you want to talk about. If you'd like to get on one of our shows, let us know what show you'd like to uh, to appear on. We are a family-friendly network here, so I would ask you to keep that in mind with your message. Uh, we may edit your message for time and clarity purposes, just so you're aware. Uh, but yes, please give us a call. You can, again, reach us at 856-403-8788. That's 856-403-8788. You can also email us at comments at insightsintothings.com or find links to all that and more on our official website, at www.insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books.